Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed. We are going on with Plato's Republic. It is now week 10. And last week, then, we saw, we were introduced to the Guardians a few weeks ago, and we saw last week that um, Plato wanted to um, get rid of some of the stories about the gods that were very popular. He said these are false stories. And they could teach our guardians to grow into cowards. And so we ended with uh, book three, section two. And let me just put that up on the screen. And um, here we see that we fear for our guardians, lest the habits of such thrills make them more sensitive and soft than we would have them. Okay, so we're making some... Uh, a little toxic masculinity here, uh, alpha males. <laughs> um, so um, we, he went on to say that we actually want the opposite of what these, he gave a bunch of sample quotes in the previous section and says here that we actually want the opposite of those. And so that's where we ended last time. We said that when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of those quotes and we're going to think about the opposite. So we're going back a few pages here. Um, this is page 203 in the text. And as always, by the way, there will be a PDF in the, um, in the not comment section, what is it? The description box. Um, there's going to be a, um, a, PDF, a PDF link for those of you who don't, who don't have the text. And if you're following in a different text, different translation, it's 386C that we're looking at here and page 203 for those of you using this text. So we had a bunch of quotes here. Of course, they're all taken out of context and we're just looking at what they mean in this context. But in the context of trying to teach, he was saying here that if you teach scary things about the afterworld, then guardians would be afraid of death and you wouldn't be a very good soldier if you feared death. And so the first quote here we saw was a leafer, which means ready and willing. So ready and willing were I in the fields up above. This is Achilles talking from the underworld. So up above is earth. Um, leafer were I in the fields up above to be served to another, tiller of some poor plot which yields him a scanty subsistence, than to be ruler and king over all the dead who have perished. And we agreed last week that this means that he would rather do any kind of menial labor, be a serf, a servant, rather than be dead. So what would the opposite be? Well, maybe instead of being mm -hmm. below, he's actually above. and. Maybe he should he should want want it or not you know detest it. Maybe it is better than uh, you know being alive in a hmm. miserable situation. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think he was in Tartarus, but he was in Hades. Um, but yeah, it's better being dead is not so bad. It's better to be dead than to be a servant or to be a serf. Right. Okay, how about the next one? Lest unto men and immortals the homes of the dead be uncovered. And they describe the underworld as horrible, noisome, dank. The gods, too, hold it in abhorrence. So this one's take, easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this one's easier because mm -hmm. it would be, you know, the gods holding the dead souls in, in higher esteem. Mm -hmm. And it being, you know, not a horrible place, mm -hmm. a uh -huh. quiet place. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Also, dank has the feeling of being dark, right? Like a cave. So the opposite would be something bright. It's bright and wonderful and the gods love it. Right? That would be the opposite feeling, something wonderful instead of horrible. Jed, I want to get you in here, too, so I want you to take the next one. 
says, ah, me, so it is true that even in the dwellings of Hades, spirit there is and wraith. Wraith is like, you know, like the spirit, like the what you can physically see when people say they see a ghost. But within there is no understanding. So what would the opposite be? Hmm. The opposite of wraith would be um, your form would be something more, I'm hesitant to say corporeal, more real than an image. If a, if a wraith is an uh, image, then whatever form you're in in the afterlife would be more real than, than that, maybe? What do you think? Uh, I was actually going to go the other way that um, instead of having a physical form at all, there'd be no form because we leave the body. Mm. Interesting. Oh, right. So, yes, oh. that was the hesitancy. So uh, mm. you wouldn't uh, leave an image of your physical form like a wraith. Uh, you wouldn't have a physical form and whatever form right. your soul takes. Yeah. Mm, yeah, what this is saying is that you have some sort of physical form that's left, but there's no understanding. What would the opposite be? Right, so not leaving any physical form, whatever um, being your soul is in would feel to you more substantial and real than even a physical form, and you would be uh, full of understanding or... Mm. Maybe the understanding process would take place there. Do you think that's more carrying understanding with you, understanding with you, or do you think uh, in the opposite, in the afterlife, there would be lots of conversations happening where understanding was being developed? What do you think? What do you think, Jacob? Well, in in the uh, mm -hmm. Phaedrus, I think. Uh, uh, Socrates says he'll he'll be in good company, so mm -hmm. poss possibly mm -hmm. uh, understanding mm -hmm. in that way. Right. Conversation. Right. We don't know what activities are going on exactly, but there's understanding there. There's mind. It's not body, but mind that survives. Hmm. Either you carry it with you, or there's lots of great chats happening, as mm -hmm. Socrates said. Maybe. Mm hmm. Uh, Soul to have wisdom and wit, but the others are shadowy phantoms. And this was a reference to a prophet who had just died. So this prophet alone had wisdom and wit, but the others are shadowy phantoms. So everyone has mm, good. wisdom. Yes. Everyone in Hades in the afterworld has mind. None of them are just shadowy figures. Next page. Forth from his limb and unwilling, his spirit flitted to Hades, wailing its doom and its lustyhood lost in the may of its manhood. What did you come up with for this one? Not, not missing your corporeal life. Good. Yes. Right, so this quote has somebody wailing its doom, dreading death and leaving the body. So the opposite would be gladly leaving, happily going to the afterworld. And rather than being worried about age or lustyhood, <laughs> say, giving all of that up, all of those bodily pleasures are gone, are, are no longer a concern. You're going to where you are ageless and never feeble. So you go happily. Mm. Sounds like people's accounts of near-death experiences, NDEs. Mm. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Every account I've ever heard, um, the person is very happy to go. And um, if they're told, sorry, you got to come, you got to go back. They don't want to go. <laughs> they don't want to return. They may return, many return for their kids, they say, but they don't really want to return otherwise. It's the opposite. Oh. They get dragged back, mm -hmm. kicking and screaming mm -hmm. rather than right. this quote. <laughs> don't make me go back. <laughs> yeah. 
Under the earth like a vapor vanished the gibbering soul. This one and the next one have that uh, gibbering uh, mm-hmm. phrase. So mm-hmm. I would say it's, you know, the opposite of gibbering or, you know, being very cognizant, uh, coherent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, good. They go to Hades, cognizant, coherent, with great clarity. Right. And even as bats in the hollow of some mysterious grotto fly with a flitter mouse shriek, and here we learn the word flitter mouse, and, uh, you know, there'll be kids all over the world wanting a flitter mouse for Christmas. It's so cute sounding. But they they fly with the shriek of like a bat, and a one of when one of them falls from the cluster whereby they hold to the rocks and they're clinging one to the other. So you have this like mass of many bats clinging one to another. And they're gibbering ghosts, as gibbering ghosts, they flitted around. What did you see as the opposite here? Well, maybe that they're uh, solo, they're by themselves, they aren't in a group. Mm-hmm. And then it has that gibbering, gibbering against them. Mm. Mm. Right. So again, there's some sort of clarity. Instead of a manyness, there's a one. Soul is one. It's not a cluster of many. They're not fearing it. As we see here, they're shrieking, they're fearing it, they're doing anything. Please don't, you know, they're grasping the rocks to try to hold on. But instead, the opposite would be going gladly. And again, instead of gibbering there's mindfulness clarity instead of all of this activity also one thing i was thinking is they're flying about and they're flitting back and forth like there's lots of movement so the opposite would be abiding in oneness and in that clarity any other thoughts there no we're good okay so that would be the opposite teaching right so he's saying What Plato is saying here is that these teachings are the very opposite of what we should be teaching kids about the afterlife or these guardians about the afterlife. Okay, this would be the right teaching. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead a bit to the next section because this is where we ended off. Section three. So we're on page 211. Let me jump ahead in my text here. So this is 388D, page 211. Okay, where Socrates is going to uh, go on with talking about these wrong teachings for the guardians. Do we keep the reading the same, the roles? Same? Okay. Okay. All right. So, Jacob, whenever you're ready, here's Socrates. For if, dear Adimantus, our young men should seriously incline to listen to such tales and not laugh at them as unworthy utterances, still less likely would any man be to think such conduct unworthy of himself and to rebuke himself if it occurred to him to do or say anything of that kind but without shame or restraint, full many a dirge for trifles would he chant, and many a a lament. You say most truly. But that must not be, as our reasoning but now showed us in which we must put our trust until someone convinces us with a better reason. No, it must not be. Again, they must not be prone to laughter, for 
Ordinarily, when one abandons himself to violent laughter, his condition provokes a violent reaction. I think so. Then, if anyone represents men of worth as overpowered by laughter, we must not accept it, much less if gods. Much indeed. Then we must not accept from Homer such sayings as these, either about the gods. Quenchless, then, was the laughter that rose from the blessed immortals when they beheld Hespestus of officiously puffing and panting. We must not accept it on your view. If it pleases you to call it mine, at any rate, we must not accept it. But further, we must surely prize truth most highly. For if we were right in what we were just saying, and falsehood is in very deed useless to gods, but to men useful as a remedy or form of medicine, it is obvious that such a thing must be assigned to physicians, and laymen should have nothing to do with it. Obviously. The rulers, then, of the city may, if anybody, fitly lie on account of enemies or citizens for the benefit of the state. No others may have anything to do with it. But for a layman to lie to rulers of that kind, we shall affirm to be as great a sin, nay, a greater, than it is for a patient not to tell his physician or an athlete, his trainer, the truth about his bodily condition or for a man to deceive the pilot about the ship and the sailors as to the real condition of himself, or a fellow sailor, and how they fare. Most true. If then the ruler catches anybody else in the city lying, any of the craftsmen, quote, whether a prophet or healer of sickness or joiner of timbers. He will chastise him for introducing a practice as subversive and destructive of a state as it is of a ship. He will, if deed follows upon word. Again, will our lads not need the virtue of self-control? Of course. And for the multitude, are not the main points of self-control these? To be obedient to their rulers and themselves to be rulers over the bodily appetites and pleasures of food, drink, and the rest? I think so. Then, I take it, we will think well such Oh, sorry. Then I think, <laughs> sorry, then I take it, we will think well said such sayings as that of Homer's Diomede. Friend, sit down and be salient and hark to the word of my bidding. And what follows? Breathing high spirit, the Greeks marched silently, fearing their captains. And all similar passages. Yes, well said. But what of this sort of thing? Heavy with wine, with the eyes of a dog and the heart of a fleet deer. And the lines that follow, are these well and other impertinences in prose or verse of private citizens to their rulers? They are not well. 
they certainly are not suitable for youth to hear for the inculcation of self-control. But if from another point of view they yield some pleasure, we must not be surprised. Or what is your view of it? This. Okay, let's go back a bit here. Um, I want to look at let's think of this page here. Okay, I'm back at 389B. I um, just want to point out the words very deed, very deed useless. So this is the sentence that reads, if we were right in what we were just saying, and falsehood is in very deed useless to gods, but to men useful as a remedy. Um, do you both see that section? Do you see the words very deed? So the yeah. Greek there is actually to onti, which means in reality or in being. And so he's saying there that falsehood is in reality useless to gods. There is no falsehood in the gods. The gods do not have appearances that they mistake as reality. They have no appearances in them. Okay, so that's a reference also back to what we were looking at last week, looking at the veritable lie when you have appearances in the soul that you mistake for reality. That's the veritable lie, the falsehood in the soul. That's not a problem that... Um, the gods have, they don't have such falsehood in reality. Okay. Um, but going back a bit here, so talking about, oh no, sorry, it's a little further down. Um, just below that, talking about the possibility of lying. And I think it was what, maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we finished recording, Jacob asked me if the veritable lie is different from the noble lie. And um you were thinking that they were, but you wanted to confirm that. And so now even here we're seeing the noble lie, right? What is the difference between them, Jacob, since that was your point? Uh, well, the, <laughs> the variable lie <laughs> is uh, just a, like a, uh, a true falsehood. But the, mm. the noble lie is something you tell to people that... Uh, you think it will better them. Mm. Uh, that lie will like somehow better better them. Mm. Right, yeah. exactly. So um, when we're first starting out, maybe we're not ready for the full truth of reality of what we truly are because we still identify with the body and so on. So it's not going to be helpful to people to give them the higher teaching, right? So there's like stages and... You can talk about the body as though it's real for the sake of discussion and talk about the individual soul as though it's real for the sake of the discussion like we're doing here. Okay, so that's the kind of lies that we can tell. And it says rulers can lie. But we should not lie to the rulers. And we'll get back to that um, because now he's going to introduce. Oh, sorry, Jed, did you want to say something? Oh, uh, the reason why the government doesn't tell us about aliens that exist. Mm. It's important they know about it, but it, there'll be a panic if, if they tell the truth to the people, mm. right? I suppose so. Um, okay, that itself was a, a metaphor that was a kind of lie to illustrate uh, the truth. Yes, yes, I, I understand. Okay, 389D, um, I want to just stick in the text here, looking at self-control. This is Sophrosun, so we're getting into one of the, um, one of the virtues. Okay, so this is Sophrosun, sometimes translated as temperance or moderation. There are various translations, so this translator uses self-control. And he says that, um, he gives here the main points of self-control. What are the main points according to this section here? To be does, obedient to the rulers mm, and yeah. have control over their appetites. Yes. And so notice here, 
Okay, this is not highlighting correctly, so I'm going to just highlight the whole two lines here. So notice here that there are two parts, right? Being obedient to the rulers, but themselves rulers over the bodily appetites. And that means that self-control for the guardians has a sort of, or the guardians have a median position here, according to this definition. Do you see that? So they're obedient to the rulers. That means the ruler, whatever the rulers represent, it's above or higher than whatever the guardians represent in our soul. But the guardians are to be rulers over the bodily appetites. That means whatever the guardians represent, that's above or higher than, than the bodily appetites and desires. Right, So the guardians have this median position in the soul. He hasn't yet clarified his tripartite soul, but the guardians are that middle part we're seeing. I think most people are familiar with the idea of a tripartite soul, so you maybe already have that in mind here, but it hasn't been introduced yet. right? But he's giving the guardians here, notice, a median position. And... Uh, yeah. Um, and I think that's the main thing to pull out here. We've already seen many, we have many quotes here giving examples of um, the wrong teachings, right, of the, these various quotes. And by the way, um, high spirit, sometimes that's, um, there are various ways to translate that here. It's just um, another translation had impassioned. Okay, so it's not thumos or... Um, soft for sin or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it here. Were there any other thoughts or comments? Anything else jump out at you here? We're good? Okay. So in the next section also, he's just going to go on giving us some more examples of Homer presenting gods and heroes as lacking soft for sin or self-control. Okay. And again, they are taken out of context. If you're familiar with any of the texts that he's quoting here, you may recognize that these are not exactly being presented accurately, but for Plato's purposes, he doesn't care. The idea here is just to show examples of what seems like, at least on the surface, to be the gods or heroes acting in ways that are not becoming of a god or a hero. Okay, so Jacob, when you're ready, please. Again, to represent the wisest man as saying that this seems to him the fairest thing in the world, when the bounty, bounteous, sorry, when the bounteous tables are standing laden with bread and with meat, and the cup bearer ladles the sweet wine out of the mixer and bears it and empties it into the beakers. Do you think the hearing of that sort of thing will conduce to a young man's temperance or self-control? Or this, hunger is the most hideous death that a mortal may suffer. Or to hear how Zeus lightly forgot all the designs which he devised, Awake while the other gods and men slept because of the excitement of his passions, and was so overcome by the sight of Hera that he is not even willing to go to their chamber, but wants to lie with her there on the ground, and says that he is possessed by a fiercer desire than when they first consorted with one another deceiving their dear parents. Nor will it profit them to hear of Aspastus's fettering of Eris and Aphrodite for a like motive. No, my Zeus, I don't think it will. But any words or deeds of endurance in the face of all odds attributed to famous men are suitable for our youth to see represented and to hear, such as 
he smote his breast and chided thus his heart. Endure my heart, for worse hast thou endured. By all means. It is certain that we cannot allow our men to be acceptors or bribes or greedy for gain. By no means. Acceptors of bribes. Neither that either. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then, but then they must not chant. Gifts move the gods, and gifts persuade persuade dread kings. Nor should we prove Achilles's attendant Phoenix as speaking fairly when he consoled him if he received gifts for it to defend the Achaean, but without gifts. Not to, li- not to lay aside his wrath, nor shall we think it proper nor admit that Achilles himself was so greedy to accept gifts from Agamemnon and again to give up a dead body after receiving payment, but otherwise to refuse. It is not right to commend such conduct. But for Homer's sake, I hesitate to say that it is positively impious to affirm such things of Achilles and to believe them when told by others, or again to believe that he said to Apollo, Me thou hast balked, far darter, the most pernicious of all gods. Mightily would I requite thee if only my hands had power. And he was disobedient to the river, who was a god, and was ready to fight with him. And again, that he said of the locks of his hair, consecrated to the other river, Beer, <laughs> beer <kiss. laughs> This let me give to take with him my hair to the hero. Pro- Patrocles. Patroclus. Who was a dead body, and that he did so we must not believe. And again, the trailings of Hector's body round the grave of Patroclus and the slaughter of living captives upon his pyre. All these we will affirm to be lies, nor will we suffer our youth to believe that Achilles, the son of a goddess and of Peleus, the most chast of men, grandson of Zeus, and himself bred under the care of the most sage Chiron was of so perturbed a spirit as to be affected with two contradictory maladies, the greed that becomes no free man, and at the same time overweening arrogance towards gods and men. You are right, I decide. Okay, thank you. So in that section there, we see again, then many examples of the gods or heroes caring too much about physical existence. So many examples of not acting with soft for soon or temperance, self-control. Um, any thoughts about that one or we'll just move on? I think just more examples, but if any hunger. Not being uh, at the whims of hunger, that's an interesting one. The, the gifts makes more sense, not doing things for bribes or, or being greedy in that sense. But interesting, because that's an outward thing, but the inner thing of, um, uh, what was the quote about hunger? Right, um, that was at the beginning of this section. Hunger is the most piteous death that a mortal may suffer. 
What does that mean? Because we all get hungry. Mm -hmm. But to dread that death worse than any other one. They're still clinging to the body. There's still suffering. So um, I think it's the difference between physical pain and suffering. If that's your fate, just accept it. <laughs> uh, that suffers. Hunger is the most piteous death that a mortal may suffer. Mm. Kind of mm. like, I think, hinting to like indulge because it's, it's saying it's piteous to not indulge in your, your hunger versus like any other type of death, maybe you're. It's not, it doesn't have that counterpart of pleasure to it. Maybe like drowning, like if you really swim, drowning would be piteous, but. Yeah. Right, like to lose yourself in, to die in the sense of losing yourself when uh, indulging in your hunger, that, that sort of thing. Or to die while hungry. Mm -hmm. That's how I took it. Die, like dying of starvation. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's to do with, um, similar to the lamenting your lustiness. Mm -hmm. Like if you're still hungry while you're dying, you're still holding on to, uh, satisfying those physical desires. That's a piteous death rather than being excited through your understanding gained by reading this kind of book excited about uh, all those great qualities we described earlier that await us in the next realm. That's right. Yeah. So we shouldn't fear our death. I think it's pitiful. Mm. Okay, going on to the next section here. Um, we're going to be switching topics here. So let's see where he's going from here then. And this is, by the way, page 221. And for those of you with a different text, it is 391D or so, just at the start of D. Neither then must we believe this or suffer it to be said that Theseus, the son of Poseidon, and Herathos, the son of Zeus, attempted such dreadful rapes, nor that any other child of a god and hero would have brought himself to accomplish the terrible and impious deeds that they now falsely relate to him, relate of him. But we must constrain the poets either to deny that these are their deeds or that they are the children of gods but not to make both statements or attempt to persuade our youth that the gods are the begetters of evil and that heroes are no better than men. For as we were saying, such utterances are both impious and false. For we proved, I take it, that for evil to arise from gods is an Im impossibility. Certainly. And they are, furthermore, harmful to those that hear them. For every man will be very lenient with his own misdeeds if he is convinced that such are and were the actions of the near-sown seed of gods, close kin to Zeus, for whom on Ida's top. Ancestral altars flame to highest heaven, nor in their lifeblood fails the fire divine. For which cause we must put down such fables, lest they breed in our youth great laxivity, or laxity, sorry, great laxity in turpentude. The last thing we want, Socrates, is laxity in turpitude, most assuredly. 
what type of discourse remains for our definition of our prescriptions and proscriptions? We have declared the right way of speaking about gods and diamonds and heroes and that other world. We have speech then about men would be the remainder. Obviously. It is impossible for us, my friend, to place this here. Why? Because I presume we are going to say that so it we are going to say that so it is that both poets and writers of prose speak wrongly about men in matters of greatest moment, saying that there are many examples of men who, though unjust, are happy, and of just men who are wretched, and that there is profit in injustice if it be concealed, and that justice is the other man's good and your own loss. And I presume that we shall forbid them to say this sort of thing and command them to sing and fable the opposite. Don't you think so? Nay, I will know it. Then if you admit that I am right, I will say that you have conceded the original point of our inquiry. Rightly apprehended. Then, as regards men, that speech must be of this kind, that is a point that we will agree upon when we have discovered the nature of justice and the proof that it is profitable to its possessor, whether he does or does not appear to be just. Most true. Good. Okay, so here we see then. That um, either we deny that the gods would do such things as this, or that they are not children of gods. Okay, so that's concluding that topic of discussion. And then he says down here, and let me get this up on his number, um, 392A. He says, we've declared the right way of speaking about gods and daimons and heroes and that other world. Okay, so that's ending that discussion. And so where would it have to go from here? What does he suggest Souls. would be the next natural step? Sorry, Jacob. Souls. Hmm. Yes, talking about he, humans and yeah. human souls. <laughs> yes. Speech then about men would be the remainder. But that's a problem. They can't do that. Why can't they do that? It presupposes the the question of what is justice. Because we, we would tell them the people <laughs> to not dress justice. We don't know what justice is. So Right. Exactly. So all of the false assumptions that were in the very setup to the challenge for Socrates would come up again. The idea, and then I'm, I'm looking at the top of page 225 here. Um, there are many examples of people who are unjust but happy, or this idea that justice is the other for the other person and it's your own loss. And so all of those very problems that Socrates saw in the setup to the challenge to him would come up again. So he says we can't then look at at people just yet. Okay, any questions or comments or thoughts about this section? He said he spoke, uh, he concluded that we have declared the right way of speaking at the bottom of 223 mm -hmm. about gods and daemons and heroes and that other world. We did spend a lot of time talking about the other world mm -hmm. through the um, uh, way of writing where he provides the negatives, mm -hmm. uh, giving us both the material 
and the question to solve the puzzle, which makes it kind of koan-like in that it's a question for the reader to do, um, and within the question contains the information the reader needs to answer the question. Um, so we did that with the other world. Um, we did talk about what the gods are not, um, and he did mention the heroes be, um, uh, again in this way of writing and this amazing way of uh, presenting ideas um, said that heroes are not the same as men. We, we mustn't allow people, uh, the poets to say that heroes are the same as men, which we can then solve the puzzle and say, well, therefore heroes must be greater than regular men perhaps somewhere in between the gods. But I don't recall anything being said about daemons. That's true. He just slipped that in there. He just slipped that in there? Hmm. What? <laughs> Why? How is this? Why are we supposed to... That stands out a little bit. Part of the other world. So he slipped them in there. Yeah. Oh, sneaky. Okay. Jacob, were you, what do you think about that? No, no, I, I took it as like, he's like doing like a metaphysical taxonomy because he was like, God, you know, gods, demons, heroes, souls. So maybe he's getting into like a emanation type thing. I don't, yeah, I don't know why he snuck it in there either. That was just what I thought on it. But you can say if it applies, if what he's saying applies to gods and heroes, then it would also apply to daimons because they're in the middle. So See, he just it, but he didn't give any examples. Yeah, he just slipped it in. He just slipped it in. And now I wonder if this, like we said, uh, uh, his amazing way of writing where he gives us koan like puzzles. I wonder if this is another kind of one where he he's not giving the negative. But he's kind of giving the negative. He's he's adding something that hasn't yet been explained that should stand out to us that maybe we can recognize and carry with us as a a um, another kind of puzzle to take with us in our reading because it does stand out. Hmm. Hmm. Possibly, yeah. Also, um, I noticed that uh, he said the gods don't do anything evil. Or the Greek bad. Um, that's interesting. I think somebody should put that in an email and send that to the um, Catholic Church. That was, yeah, the first law. That the gods are only good and do no evil. Yes. Very important. Yes. Okay, section six, starting just above 392D. Now, this concludes the topic of tales. And so the next topic he's going to go on here, and my mouse is not working right here. Okay, the next topic he's going to look at is what he's calling diction. Okay, so that's our new topic. So we're finished with the tales. Now we're going to look at diction. Okay, so Socrates, when you're ready. So this concludes the topic of tales. That of diction, I take it, is to be considered next. So we shall have completely examined both the matter and the manner of speech. I don't understand what you mean by this. Well, we must have you understand. Perhaps you will be more likely to apprehend it thus. Is not everything that is said by fabulists or poets a narration of past, present, or future things? What else could it be? Do not they proceed either by pure narration or by a narrative that is affected through imitation or by both? This too. I still need to have made plainer. I, I seem to be a ridiculous and obscure teacher. 
So like men who are unable to express themselves, I won't try to speak in wholes and universals, but will separate off a particular part, and by the example of that, try to show you my meaning. Tell me, do you know the first lines of the Iliad, in which the poet says that Chryseis implored Agamemnon to release his daughter, and that the king was angry, and that Chryseis, failing of his request, impre- <laughs> imprecated. Imprecated. He invoked, uh, he invoked curses. He made curses. It, imprecated curses on the Achaeans in his prayers to the god. I do. You know then that as far as these verses and prayed unto all the Achaeans, chiefly to Atreus's sons, twin leaders who marshaled the people, the poet himself is the speaker and does not even attempt to suggest to us that anyone but himself is speaking. But what follows he delivers as if he were himself Chryseis and tries as far as may be to make us feel that not Homer is the speaker, but the priest and old man. And in this manner, he has carried on nearly all the rest of his narration about affairs and in Ilion, all that happened in Ithaca and the entire Odyssey. Quite so. Now, it is narration, is it not, both when he presents the several speeches and the matter between the speeches? Of course. But when he delivers a speech as if he were someone else, shall we not say that he then assimilates thereby his own diction as far as possible to that of the person whom he announces as about to speak? We shall obviously. And is not likening oneself to another in speech or bodily bearing an imitation of him to whom one likens oneself? Surely. In such cases, then, it appears he and the other poets affect their narration through imitation. Certainly. But if the poet should conceal himself nowhere, then his entire poetizing and narration would have been accomplished without imitation. And lest you may say again that you don't understand, I will explain to you how this would be done. If Homer, after telling us that Chryseis came with the ransom of his daughter and as a supplicant of the Achaeans, but chiefly of the kings, had gone on speaking not as if made or being Chryseis, but still as Homer, you are aware that it would not be imitation but narration, pure and simple. It would have been somewhat in this wise. I will state it without meter, for I am not a poet. The priest came and prayed that to them the gods should grant to take Troy and come safely home, but that they should accept the ransom and release his daughter out of reverence for the god. And when he had thus spoken, the others were of reverent mind and approved. But Agamemnon was angry and bade him depart and not come again, lest the scepter and the fillets 
of the god should not avail him, and ere his daughter should be released, he said, she would grow old in Ergos with himself, and he ordered him to be off and not vex him if he wished to get home safe. And the old man, on hearing this, was frightened and departed in silence. And having gone apart from the camp, he prayed at length to Apollo, invoking the appellations of the god, and reminding him of and asking requital for any of his gifts that had found favor, whether in the building of temples or the sacrifice of victims. In return for these things, he prayed that the Achaeans should suffer for his tears by the gods' shafts. It is in this way, my dear fellow, that without imitation, simple narration results. I understand. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the beginning of this section. And here we see that we're going on to the topic of diction. And to explain a little bit further, he says that um, we have completely examined the matter of the speech. Um, and, but now we have to look at the manner, okay, how we go about it. So we've talked about the matter as in terms of what we should discuss. So the laws and these are the teachings that are no good and these are the things that we should teach. So that's the matter of it. Okay, the con, the actual subject, the substance. But now we're looking at the manner. And to talk about manner, he introduces three possible ways that we can go about it. What is he talking about here? It's at the bottom of the page here. There are three possibilities. Is, is one of them narration? Mm, good. Yes. So narration is one. What's the other one? Imitation. Imitation. And the third possibility? So pure narration, pure imitation, what would the third be? Is it a mixture? Exactly. Okay. So this is the bottom of page 225. Do not they proceed either by pure narration or by a narrative that is affected through imitation or by both? Okay. What does he mean by imitation? You can see a nice definition at the top of 229. likening oneself to another in speech or bodily bearing. Good. Yes, exactly. And what does that mean? Copying someone, trying to be like them. Right. Talking like them, acting like them with your gestures. Okay, and we can see this in our own lives, that we have imitation. You may have some of the same body language as your parents, some of the same speech patterns, say some of the same things, or have false beliefs that you picked up from them. That's imitation for him. Okay, that's what he's talking about. And remember, as we're reading this, we always want to be thinking of how this applies to the soul. Because on the surface, when you're talking about Making laws for a city-state, this seems kind of weird to be the thing you're talking about. But obviously, he's talking about the soul, really. All right, so we're looking at imitation in the soul, so we're thinking about that. Um, likening oneself to another in speech or bodily bearing is an imitation of him to whom one likens oneself. Right, imitating your parents, your teachers, and so on. 
How does he explain a few lines later what narration is as a contrast to imitation? Either of you can jump in. We have a third person here as well. Hello, I did notice you come on. I just, no, no camera. So I think maybe you don't want to speak. And I want to respect that. So this doesn't mean necessarily um, that if you are a musician, for example, you shouldn't write from the perspective of a character. It's just a metaphor for something else in the soul. Hmm. Yeah, on the surface, it's that. On the surface, it's yeah. In, like he gives the examples in poetry and in comedy and tragedy of imitation. And so on the surface, it's that. But th when we're looking at it in terms of the soul, then we would have to look at imitation in our own lives, in our own soul. Is it both? Like he's saying that the um, poets shouldn't make false stories about the gods mm -hmm. as a metaphor for our soul. But would it also apply that the poets shouldn't do that? Is it both or is it just the soul? Well, I don't particularly put much weight in the city-state that he's building. Um, you have to ask yourself, you know, what the poets represent in our lives. And those are the things that we want to cut out, like the false teachings in our lives. And so there is a social level, right? Because like there was that line about the poets should not our mothers should not teach what the poets are, should not repeat the things that the poets teach. So the teachings that the, our parents have that gave us false beliefs are things that we have to be cautious of. And we do see a lot of false beliefs in our society. And so we can see how changing those teachings would um, have a positive effect on society. So there is an aspect, certainly, where I think you can make the case that it has its social um, social aspect. That makes but sense. Our, mm -hmm. our focus, of course, is on the soul. Mm -hmm. So if you were, as you function in the everyday world, if you were a poet yourself or you make something artistic or you're a musician or a writer, um, he's saying he's not talking specifically about that, but one leads into another. If you are telling stories about the divine, it would be better to tell the truth hmm. um, because it has that flow on effect, especially if you become popular. But we can also maybe add in the idea of the um, noble lie. Like sometimes it is okay to use a falsehood um, when dealing with humans specifically. So maybe that re applies to satire where you can imitate yeah. someone to make fun of them to tell the truth. I think the key to this dilemma that you're bringing up is having a healthy soul in oneself. If you read this from the perspective of the of what he's saying about the soul, and you go through the stages of educating your own soul and bringing your own soul to a healthy place, then if you are functioning as an author, as a musician, you're contributing to um, pop culture to the social realm in that way, then the work that you put out is going to reflect the health in your own soul. And if you choose also to um, fall back on noble lies, then it will be done wisely with the understanding of what is true so that and using it as an educational tool. Right. That's that right. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even in this example, uh, the difference between narration and imitation, mm -hmm. I, I know that sometimes I'm talking to a person in the everyday world and they're uh, giving a narration of something that happened that maybe disturbed them. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, oh, and this other person went up to me and then he did this. And then they'll mm -hmm. shift into an imitation of that person and get really loud and violent. Mm -hmm. And I notice mm -hmm. that even though he's just imitating the person, he himself is now acting that way and is scaring everybody else in the circle, that kind of thing. Would this apply or is that, that too literal? 
Um, well, that is an imitation, but that, that what's really important is not the bodily behavior, but getting that false belief out of your soul. Because <laughs> if the person is is acting from it, they might be because they're being a, they're triggered, and that means there's something they need to look at. Right, That's right. The aspect of it that I would focus on. That makes sense because that was the thing I noticed that even though, yes, first of all, they were triggered by it. So there's something they're carrying already about it being interesting and believable. But also I did notice that there was a kind of, um, I don't know, catharsis or, or, or desire to play that role that they recognize as bad in some way, but they did feel good in in being the one that that was the doing the yelling, um, even in just... Ner- shifting from narration of what happened Mm -hmm. and that would be the issue in the soul worth exploring right yeah i can't comment on the specifics because i don't know the people but yeah that basically fits um what does he say here about narration he says if the poet should conceal himself nowhere then his entire poetizing and narration would have been accomplished without imitation so a narration without imitation. Look how he describes it. Conceal himself nowhere. Yeah, actually, I just look at the Greek there. I'm curious if, if it's actually himself or itself. Conceal the self nowhere or conceal himself. I'm not sure what the Greek is. But it's a very curious way of wording it, right? <clears throat> the self is not hidden. Because when we're imitating, we're taking on the behaviors, the beliefs, the characteristics of others who have influenced us. And to that degree that we're doing that, we're concealing our own self. Isn't that part of the learning process? Like if you want to become a mechanic, you start by kind of imitating how your mechanic teacher functions. Mm Mm-hmm and acts and talks to other customers and relates to an engine and so on. Yeah, but we're talking about the self, about the soul. Right, because our goal ultimately is to know thyself. So we're not talking about learning mechanics or that kind of thing. But yes, that's how you may learn how to function in a business environment or something. But we're looking at it at a deeper level right in a different sense i'm I'm using mechanic i guess as a metaphor for um, maybe a philosopher um you might start um with all of the training from your society and your family imitating their way of being then you come across somebody who who acts more like socrates um and and you start by imitating him, kind of. You, you speak more openly, you discuss more important matters, you try and keep the conversation alive and moving forward and sidestepping all of the possible shutting downs of the logos. W- would that be an imitation that is good? Well, I, I think we're going to see coming up. Um, I don't want to say too much about this now because it is coming up, but the idea that if you're going to imitate somebody, it should be somebody good, somebody virtuous, somebody wise. Thus, the importance of the poets telling good stories about heroes. Mm. Mm. Yes. And also, by the way, I was looking up this section while you were talking. The reason I looked a little distracted is because I was checking another translation. Where it says here, conceal himself nowhere. Another translation that's more literal is hide himself from self. that he should not at all hide himself from self. Okay, and remember our goal throughout all of this, what's guiding us is to know thyself. So would that answer my question? Are you at the early stage of learning, which involves some imitation, are you doing that so that you can discover the self and know and show yourself most fully, mm-hmm. in which case it has a different 
meaning mm. than if you were imitating somebody because you thought you weren't good enough mm. or to hide from yourself or to not know yourself. Would that be an answer? Well, um, I think that you, there's like a continuum of sorts. You know, we don't have to necessarily come into our studies fully enlightened and already having this state of mind like Socrates is. But um, I would say that while imitating someone like Socrates could, it, it would be better than imitating someone um, like Andrew Tate or whatever, but it doesn't mean that this is what it means to be wise because it doesn't mean you have the state of mind of Socrates. You can imitate him, but you don't really understand his state of mind. And so your imitation may be off and you may misunderstand him or whatever. And so it's not the same as actually being in that state of mind and just naturally acting from the state of mind of a wise person. Like Socrates is just acting naturally from his own state of mind not imitating anybody else and that's a very and we're more concerned about the state of mind than about the behavior outwardly someone who who's watching you and socrates may if your imitation is very good that person may not know the difference but that doesn't mean that the state of mind of these two people is the same right so we're talking about the ideal we are seeking to be and reach hmm. Exactly. And so what we're looking at here is this question of which is we have three possibilities of imitation. When you're solely caught up in imitation, you have no idea who you are and you're just always trying to fit society or whatever. Right. You can think of that. Maybe think of yourself when you were younger or think of somebody that you see now who's very riddled with insecurities and has no sense of who they are and caught up in image. Versus somebody like Socrates, who is the opposite extreme of just like never imitating and always being in himself. Maybe most of us are that third category of both. Where we're ridding ourselves of some of this imitation. So we do have our moments of pure narration, to use his language here, when we can just act from a certain state of mind that is healthy and just be. But we still have some imitation in us. And to the degree we have imitation, hopefully it's the healthier kind, the relatively healthier kind. Again, kind of like a, a mean, which has mm -hmm. cropped up a lot today. There being um, like the rulers are to the guardians uh, and then the guardians become like a mean to ruling over our own pleasures and hungers. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, equally so the gods and the heroes and, and men. And here we see uh, the pure narration, the mixed as a transitional sort of point mm -hmm. and the pure imitation. Mm -hmm. Interesting theme that's yeah. here. Mm. One, one more. I just thought of one more example oh. from our passage of the mean, uh, the noble lie, which we talked about, which uh, isn't actually a lie, isn't actually the truth, but is a kind of a mixture of, of both uh, using a lie to tell the mm -hmm. truth. There's another one that's ruined in there because it's awesome. Really beautiful. That middle, the middle road. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think we have time for at least one more section here. Um, and as we're going through this again, we want to be asking ourselves what Plato was really saying about imitation. What role would it play in the soul? Because, of course, what we're seeing here is in his explanation of imitation is at that level, at that social level of the poets and how the poets write. Okay, but that's not really the big issue that this dialogue is about. It's not, if that's all he wrote about, it wouldn't still be famous 2,000 years later. There's something more going on here. And that's what we want to have in the back of our minds as we're going through this section. Okay, so Jacob, whenever you're ready. Sure. Understand, then, that the opposite of this arises when one removes the words of the poet between and leaves the, alternate, the alternation of speeches. This, too, I understand. It is what happens in tragedy. You have convinced me most rightly. 
And now I think I can make plain to you what I was unable to before, that there is one kind of poetry and tale-telling which works wholly through imitation. As you remarked, tragedy and comedy and another which employs the recital of the poet himself, best exemplified, I presume, in the Dithyram. And there is again that which employs both in epic poetry and in many other places, in If You Apprehend Me. I understand now what you then meant. Recall then also the preceding statement that we were done with the what of speech and still had to consider the how. I remember. What I meant then was just this, that we must reach a decision whether we are to suffer our poets to narrate as imitators or in part as imitators and in part not. And what sort of things, each case, in each case, or not allow them to imitate at all? I divine that you are considering whether we shall admit tragedy and comedy into our city or not. Perhaps, and perhaps even more than that, for I certainly do not yet know myself, but Whithersoever the wind, as it were, of the argument blows, there lies our course. Well said, whithersoever. This then, Adimantus, is the point we must keep in view. Do we wish our guardians to be good mimics or not? Or is this also a consequence of what we said before, that each one could practice well only one pursuit, and not many? But if he attempted the latter, dabbling in many things, he would fail of distinction at all. Of course it is. And does not the same rule hold for imitation? that the same man is not able to imitate many things well as he can one? No, he is not. Still less, then, will he be able to combine the practice of any worthy pursuit with the imitation of many things, and the quality of a mimic. Since, unless I mistake, the same men cannot practice well at once even the two forms of imitation that appear most nearly akin as the writing of tragedy and comedy. Did you not just now call these two imitations? I did, and you are right in saying that the same men are not able to succeed in both, nor yet be at once good rhapsodists and actors. True, but neither can the same men be actors for tragedies and comedies, and all these are imitators, or imitations, are they not? Yes, imitations. And to still smaller coinage than this, in my opinion, Adimantus, proceeds the fractioning of human faculty so as to be incapable of imitating many things, or of doing the things themselves of which the imitations are likenesses. Most true. Okay, good. Okay, so going back to the beginning here, um, he again mentions this what and how. We're done with the what of speech, we have to consider the how. So this is back to the idea of um, the matter and manner of speech. So another way of saying the same thing. And here he introduces the idea of um, not doing, we cannot do many things well. The same man is not able to imitate many things well as he can 
one. This is at around 395A. Robin Williams, Jim Carrey. Um, these are all comedic actors who can do drama well. Uh -huh. Yeah, so if you take it literally, it doesn't work. That's true. Ah, good. Yeah. You can think of comedians who can do drama. You can think of dramatic actors who can do comedy. We have our different moods, different sides of us. Yes. But here we cannot imitate many things well as we can one. And yeah. Yeah, so it, it doesn't work literally. So then we have to ask ourselves, what's he really saying here? So follow the reasoning. Oh, sorry. Oh. No, no, go ahead. Yeah. So following the reasoning of books two and three so far, then, um, who do we imitate? Higher people we look up to. Hmm. Okay, for example, hmm. for example, in, in your life, who would you say? Are your influences the people that you might be imitating? Parents, hmm. role models, maybe hmm. good good yeah. teachers. Hmm. Good. Yeah. Right. Parents, neighbors, some um, religious figures. If you grew up in a religious home, teachers. If any influenced you, coaches. If you did sports or that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, these sorts of people would be the people that might potentially be the ones that we imitate. We cannot imitate many things well. And remember earlier when he was first building the Republic, he was saying that each person should do just one job. Right. And this was especially true. He said of the guardians, you don't want um, these like um, reservists. I mean, we want a real military. They should be focused just on that. And so this is carrying that idea. And this idea is going to keep going. And so I'm hesitant to say too much here, but he's going to, we're going to see this idea continuing on as we go through and as we get to the definition of justice. This is going to play into it. So this idea that we cannot do many things well. We should be more focused, more uni um, unified in our actions and in our behavior. Right. So in dealing with the how, so we, we had the, the matter or the what of our speech, and now we're looking at the manner or the how. And in dealing with the how, he's saying in a more unified way, not imitating many things, often many different directions. So if you think of the people who influence you, sometimes you act this way, sometimes that way. Often when we first come to philosophy, we find that we act one way with our family and another way with our friend group and another way, you know, one way when we were in high school with our old high school friends when we come home and another way when we're at university or if you work away from home, you have your, your way of behaving when you're there. And then when you go home to visit your family and you see your old friends from high school, you act a whole different way. That's a person who's very fractured, imitating many different patterns. He's saying, that's not good. You can't do that well. You're not going to do that wisely. Okay, so but we're going to see this idea coming up again and again. And uh, there are a few other lines worth pulling out. Um, he keeps mentioning tragedy and comedy, and we want to yeah, think about what he's talking about there. Because as Jed pointed out, there have been comedians who did some very good dramatic performances. So that's not what he's saying. So we got to figure out what that is. And this last part, I really like this last part here, how he ended it here saying, um, 
This, though smaller coinage than this, in my opinion, Eddie Montes, precedes the fractioning of human faculty. So there's that idea of splitting into many different sides of ourselves, right? So as to be incapable of imitating many things or of doing the things themselves of which the imitations are likenesses. You can't do any, you're, you really don't know yourself. And remember again, his, um, I forget the phrasing he used before, but um, that line, that way he described narration is you're concealing yourself nowhere, never concealing yourself from self. But when you're fractured in many different ways, you can't do any of those imitations well. It's like, it's like trying to hold on to, to when people who lie a lot, they can't remember their own lies. They can't remember it. When you have to, when you're trying to imitate many different people, you're fractured. You can't remember all these imitations and you, you, you lose the self. Well, what are your thoughts on this? This is my thoughts on it. What are your thoughts as you're reading through this section? So we, mm -hmm. we are on the guardians, on the what side, we established that they are intermediary between the, mm -hmm. the ruler. They have someone above them and they rule mm -hmm. over the temperance. They, they should keep you temperate. And they rule over the appetites and desires. Yeah. Right. And so right. following the rulers is one side of temperance. Ruling over the appetites is the other side of temperance. Right. Right. So that's like what, what they do. And mm -hmm. so now we switched over yeah. to like, how, how do they do it? Mm. By imitating you know the the best person whoever they can find that's that's acting the best well or i would just say even... that we haven't yet voted we were given these three options but we haven't yet gotten to the section where they decided the conclusion of that so we okay. haven't yet said is it imitation is it narration or is it both but we're just introducing those three at this point Okay, so we're still developing that question of the how. He mentioned the uh, the dithyram. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll have to uh, further research that. <laughs> the, uh, what a dithyram is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the pure narration form of mm -hmm. poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't have an example of a dithyram for you. Yeah. And Jed, any thoughts? I'm puzzled about something said earlier about uh, the gods shouldn't be represented as laughing. Mm. I didn't understand yeah, that. The footnote says that there was some idea that violent laughter was something negative, according to the footnote. I'm not really sure about that myself. Right. Mm. The only thing I can think of is maybe drunken laughter, mm. uh, where the laughter um, is. Um, fueled by that drunkenness which then fuels the um the negative aspects of our character um the lecherous sort of laughter um which because the laughter is from that negative state of mind it also uh, accompanies that short-temperedness someone in that drunken laughter state um might also be quick to anger mm -hmm. yeah that's i i can't say because that's reading a lot into the idea of laughter i'm not sure where it where exactly the because i think you got the situation yeah. or what circumstances i don't know they talk about it in like in aristotle as like mm -hmm. the because they say like humans are the only animal that laughs it's like they have a word for it i think it's like nay ability or something like that mm -hmm. but uh when you laugh, like there's a a theory. It's not Aristotle's, but you know that it's you, you're surprised that in God the gods wouldn't be surprised since mm -hmm. they are, uh, you know, 
understanding of mm. all these things. Right. So that makes sense because that's how comedy works is that it's a twist, right? Like you're going along a certain way and then there's a twist. So there's a certain surprise in laughter. Which is why it's uh, often related to enlightenment, the sudden awakening when you realize something obvious that had been there the whole time embedded within the first mm -hmm. story you were following, that you didn't see it. And then that sudden shift of perspective and you suddenly becomes, often people laugh when they have that experience. Right. Uh, yeah. But I suppose if you're already enlightened, then yes, but I'm not sure about that because then I wonder... Um, I wonder if the gods themselves are wondering if there is a dynamic process within the divine of unfolding and knowing itself. Maybe it is uh, experiencing some sort of wonder or surprise or, or, or something of that nature. I can't say. But it doesn't say that there should be no laughter at all, just not violent laughter. So I'm not sure what the cultural implication was of that. All right, we can but. keep that. Although it'd be, an, a, it's an interesting idea. It'd be a good title for a book. Do the gods laugh? Hmm. There you go. Um, also, um, the whole thing that we've been reading so far, mm -hmm. it stands out to me that the the negative that we're given seems like a far more easy and um, far more able to be described in poetry, in prose, the many, the differences, the, the um, uh, um, different states of mind, the drama, I can see how that would be far easier to put into a, a poem or a song or a story, whereas the opposite that we're describing, unified, at rest, simple, I find that that would be very, very difficult to make into a poem or a story or a song. What w it, it almost seems impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, not impossible, but yeah, there's a challenge there. Like, it'd be like a going up to play a song, but instead of playing all the many different notes that have its tension and, and resolution and, and, um, and narrative movement and discussion, Discovery. You just go up on stage, you play one chord, that's it. Just one. No manyness, no difference, no ups and downs, no surprise, no need for laughter. That would be a very boring song. Bit for pigs? <laughs> I, uh, I don't think even pigs would enjoy that song. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe we need the more luxurious high fever song <laughs> uh, I, I guess it's kind of like and this also applies with imitations it's easier to imitate someone who is crazy and outrageous and and wacky and 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 not temperant and and can't do anything well but if someone can do something very like try imitating Lionel Messi good luck like he does something very very well just as it would be harder to write stories about the gods the way that we're describing them truthfully to be, it would be hard to imitate that kind of human person who embodies that character within them, their soul. Mm. Yeah. And that actually touches on what we're going to read next week. Okay, so I want to stop it there for today. Um, okay. For then, when we go on, then we will continue with the topics actually that Jed was bringing up. They are mentioned and they come up in the next section, and so we'll save that discussion for next week and see what so what Plato does with it, what Socrates does with it. Um, so those of you watching on YouTube, as always, oh sorry, no, I forgot to transition back, take off the text. There we go. So thank you for watching as always. And I thank both of you and our mystery guest as well. Thank you for sitting in with us and hope that you all join us next week. So long.